Hey Creep Freaks, Ren here. Got a nice Bermuda Triangle ghost story for you tonight. Let's get on with it. Ghostly Voyage or the Ghostly Haunting of a Cruise Ship Written and read by Ren Bryant One dead, heart attack while at sea. That's all I know. That's what the ship doctor said on the phone anyways. But if that's all it was, they wouldn't have called me in. I don't investigate simple heart attacks. Well, I guess I'll find out more when I get to inspect the ship. The people working on the ships jokingly call me the Ghostbuster. Sometimes they hum the X-Files song as I walk past. It's all a bit derogatory, I guess, but I don't say anything. The cruise liners call me in when they got a strange and unexplained death on one of their ships. I guess it's what you'd call my area of expertise, my specialty. Usually, these cases turn into something routine. I mean, death happens more than you think at these cities of the sea. A lot of the time, there's foul play involved. An angry boyfriend or husband too wasted on endless booze who pushes over the missus, knowing her body will never be found. But it's not always like that. Sometimes I don't have any answers. Sometimes it's a feeling, a tingle of electricity that makes the hair on my arm stand up. Sometimes there's a cold spot pointing to the presence of things I can't explain. And when all signs point to the paranormal, I bring in my medium friend, Lucy Staub, to help rid the spirits and cleanse the ship from the presence. That usually does the trick. The spirit cleansing is never on the invoice. I'm discreet with my investigations. That's why the cruise industry hires me. The dirty secret of the cruise industry is that most of the ships sailing out of Miami pass through the Bermuda Triangle. The Devil's Triangle, they call it. There's been all sorts of disappearances over the years in the Bermuda Triangle. Plenty of other strange occurrences, too. Things like electrical malfunctions on boats and planes while they go through it. Of course, the cruise lines play down the dangers. They tell passengers it's all fantastic tales of superstition. It's like the Wizard of Oz telling Dorothy not to look behind the curtain. Now, I can't say which cruise ships are haunted, but the one thing I can say for sure is that you won't see me getting on any of those cruise ships and leaving the dock. Not with what I experienced. It happened my first and only time taking a cruise. My wife convinced me to do the vacation. She knew I got nervous out on the water, that I didn't even like being out on a lake. But she convinced me it'd be fun to go cruising. These ships are so big you won't even realize you're on the water, she said. I said, yeah, but what if something happens, you know, the Titanic and all that? She laughed and said, Kevin, don't be such a scaredy cat. Things have come a long way since that era. She says, when's the last time I've read about a big cruise ship going down? She said, it doesn't happen anymore, not with radar and all the sensors they have. But I'll tell you, the thing that got me to agree to get on the water was her saying we have to have some fun before we couldn't enjoy it anymore. When she said that, it pulled at my heart. Vicky had some health scares lately, and though we weren't quite ready for the home yet, We weren't spring chickens anymore. I was worried sick about something happening to her, of losing her. The doc said she was better now, but I'm still afraid about what the future will bring. So I tried to pay more attention to Vicky than I used to. And that's why I said yes to that cruise. I'll tell you, having to do that safety briefing first thing, that wasn't too reassuring. The staff went through all the procedures in case of an emergency how to get on their tiny emergency boats, how to put on your life vest. All I could think was that we were all doomed. It was on day three of the cruise that I saw something that forever changed my life. I can't shake the image, even to this day. That woman in the gray wool dress, floating down the hallway of the ship, glowing, dripping water. Her brown hair rippled behind her in the air and her face was this pale waterlogged white. She had dead and black orbs for eyes and her mouth, it dribbled froth. 
At first, I thought I was hallucinating, that I had too much at the bar. But then she passed right through me with an icy blast that rattled my bones. I thought of my wife when it was happening. It was like an intense shot of sorrow or remorse. But as quickly as the ghost entered me, she left and departed through a wall. It only took seconds. My knees buckled and I fell to the floor and fainted. When I came around, one of the ship's doctors was tending to me. But what I saw next scared me more than the ghost. There was another ship doctor inside my room, tending to my wife. She said she had what she called a heart hiccup. She said she was the one that called for the docs. She didn't even know about me on my back in the hallway. I felt sick and jittery after that. I felt like I was going mental. The ship's doctors told me it was probably my nerves. They gave me a variety of pills, things to calm me down, settle my stomach, make me sleep. I took all of them at once, mixing the pills with some Jack Daniels. It didn't help. When we got back ashore, my jitters never left. My hands got so shaky that it made it impossible for me to continue at the Miami PD. I couldn't shoot for shit anymore, so I was forced to retire. Now, I was only a few years away from retirement anyways, but being forced out like I did, well, that just plain sucked. I talked to a shrink about what happened, and she said I needed to confront my fear. She said anxiety is normal as you age, and there's big life changes. The shrink also suggested I keep up my passions. She says it's important to do things you love. Since I had a desire to continue with my police work, I started doing private investigations. And doing so also allowed me to look into what I experienced on that cruise ship. So I started specializing in unresolved and mysterious crimes, what some people call the paranormal. And I brought in Lucy whenever a case called for it. At the ship's gangway, the doctor was there to meet me and show me his report about the man who died of the heart attack. Luckily, I got there before my former brothers in blue. I never used to mind showing up and seeing some familiar faces from the force. They ribbed me about being a private dick, and I'd tell them how wonderful life was, how I got to set my own hours and didn't have the chief breathing down my neck. It was always playful banter and kept me feeling connected to the force. But most of my friends are out of police work now, and these new guys, well, they're straight business, so I just do my best to avoid them wherever possible. I asked the doc to walk with me through the ship, but he refused. I thought it was just a heart attack, I said. He scratched the back of his neck and looked down. I knew there was something more to this going on. Heart attack my ass. I could feel it in my bones. I boarded the ship and walked slowly, my eyes scanning the report. The man was an older cruiser, about my age, but sailing alone. The security camera showed he ate at the buffet, walked to an area at the center of the ship called the park, and then proceeded to his room, number 5042. I sat in the security office and watched the video over and over. The image on the screen revealed an elderly man that had a look of sheer horror etched into his face. His eyes bulged with terror and his bony fingers clutched at his chest as if he was trying to rip out his own heart. Suddenly, without warning, he collapsed against the wall like a marionette whose strings had been cut, his lifeless body crumpling to the floor. As I began my investigation, retracing the path the old man took, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching me. I turned around multiple times, but there was nothing but empty space. Honestly, I hate it when cases got like this, when the chills came back and my mind started playing tricks on me. After my cruising incident, I used to see her all the time, that pale-skinned woman with the foaming mouth. Mostly it was in my dreams, Sometimes she would gurgle words and water would come out behind them. There were a few times in previous cases I was investigating that I swear I saw her out of the corner of my eye, floating down the hallway as she was before. 
I talked to my shrink about it, and she said it was good and healthy that I had these visions. I was manifesting my fears, she said, getting over them. Though the old man died outside in the hallway, I wanted to check his room. The cruise company told me it was clean, that there was no signs of anything amiss. It had his clothes, his toiletries, a comb and toothbrush, and a bottle of Zestril to treat his high blood pressure. The doctor told me that was the only drug in the man's body and it didn't play any role in his death. The room itself was a claustrophobic interior space with no windows intended for solo travelers. A digital picture of the ocean hung opposite the bed, a poor attempt to mimic the outside world. I couldn't fathom why anyone would opt to spend their vacation cooped up in such a cramped windowless cell. It was no wonder the old man had wandered aimlessly about the ship as captured by the security footage. The room was clean, just as I was told. Even the cups had that little white paper hat over the top of the rim to indicate they were untouched. As I exited the room, a glimmer caught my eye. It was a silver necklace on the counter that wasn't there before. I looked around, thinking somebody was playing a gag on me, maybe a deckhand or a cleaning person. But the door was closed and locked. I was the only one in the room. I picked up the necklace, opening a locket to reveal a black and white photograph of a young woman. She appeared to be from another era, with her flawless face and piercing eyes. Her hair was tied in a tight bun, and she wore a ruffled dress that seemed straight out of the Civil War era. The air around me suddenly turned cold as ice. That familiar chill crept up my spine, the feet of a thousand spiders. A wave of recognition washed over me as I realized where I had seen her before. It was the floating woman from my cruise, the ghost. Her hair was different, but that face, those eyes... It was her. That same sensation of bone-chilling fear that had plagued me then returned with a vengeance, and I couldn't help but drop the locket as I felt a presence in the room with me. As the tiny oval clattered to the ground, it disappeared into the deep maroon industrial carpet, taking my nerve with it. I ran from the room and immediately dialed Lucy. I was going to need her help. Did you see her? Lucy asked. Her voice carried a hint of excitement. She was always like this when I called her to help on a case. I shook my head. No, but I felt her, I replied, rubbing my hands together to dispel the eerie feeling that lingered in the air. It felt way worse than anything we've dealt with before. Maybe it just brought back too many bad memories for me, I don't know, but I think we got a doozy here. Show me where it happened, where everything happened, both to the man and you, Lucy said. The thought of stepping back on board made my skin crawl. Now I understood why the doctor wouldn't escort me onto the ship. I scratched my chin and chewed at my lower lip, hesitating to relive the feeling of my bones being turned to ice. As a cop, I've seen my fair share of atrocities, from bullet-ridden bodies to drug-induced cannibalism. But this was different. This was something that defied explanation. Something that played with your mind and senses and made you doubt your own sanity. One run-in with the spirit that sent me to retirement was enough. I had no desire to tempt fate with a second encounter. But a paycheck is a paycheck and I could use the money. Plus, this time I had Lucy with me. Lucy has a way of calming the spirits of restoring balance to a place plagued by paranormal activity. But if I was honest, I did wonder if what was waiting for us was too much even for her. I took a deep breath and led Lucy onto the ship, down the narrow hallways towards the door marked 5042. Lucy's eyes widened and she raised her hands to her temples. Her fingers splayed like she was trying to touch something that wasn't there. There's something here, she whispered. Something very strong. 
I could feel it too, a hum in the air, a vibration that rattled the windows and made the curtains dance. It was like the ship was alive, pulsing with an energy that was out of this world. What do we do? I asked. We stay, Lucy said, her eyes blazing with determination. We stay the night and make contact. The spirit wants to be heard, and we're going to give it a voice. I want it to protest. No way in hell I want it to spend the night aboard with this thing. I'm not new at this, but this ghost or whatever, it was different. It made my whole soul cold. But at the same time, I did trust Lucy. She did sense things that no one else could, and she made sense of the chaos that surrounded us. And most importantly, I couldn't solve this case without her. Sure, I could track, follow leads, and do investigative work, but I didn't know squat about banishing spirits. We called the cruise company and made our request. They were reluctant to let us stay, but Lucy's reputation as a paranormal expert and my background as a former cop convinced them that it was okay. They even strong-armed the doctor and a cook to stay with us, and they told us we'd get a visit from the captain as well. As the night drew on, the ship creaked and groaned around us, like an old man settling into his bed. The doctor snored loudly in the next room and the cook was busy doing his thing in the galley. But Lucy and I were wide awake, our eyes fixed on that empty space in the room where I found the locket, where we thought the ghost was lurking. Lucy closed her eyes and took a deep breath. She picked up a bundle of dried sage and lit it, letting the smoke waft through the air. I hated the pungent smell. It reminded me of burnt Thanksgiving turkey. Lucy said it was necessary, though, that it helped suffocate the spirit to get it to retreat. Next, Lucy took out a small vial of holy water, which was blessed by a priest. She sprinkled it into a protective circle around us. A hissing sound like a tire deflating filled the room. Are you here? Lucy asked, her voice clear and strong. Can you hear us? Suddenly, the air around us grew thick, like we were wading through molasses. The furniture shook and the lamps flickered. And then, a woman's voice, something low and guttural, like it was coming from the depths of hell. I am here, she said. We looked for the source of the voice, but there was none. But then I saw her, the woman in the gray wool dress, floating in the corner of the room. She looked exactly as she did the first time I saw her on my cruise, her heavy clothes dripping water, her deadened face with foam bubbling from her lips. She looked at me with those black eyes and flashed a horrifying grimace. Hey, Lucy, I whispered. Do you see her? Who? she asked, looking around. The woman in the gray dress, the one standing in the corner. Lucy looked in the direction I was pointing, but saw nothing. I don't see anyone, Kevin. I shook my head, unsure of what to make of the situation. When I looked again, the apparition was gone. Maybe I was just tired and my mind was playing tricks on me. I mean, pulling all-nighters is a pain in the ass after 55. After a period of calm, strange things began to happen again. Doors would open and close by themselves, and I heard strange whispers in the hallway. Every hour, it seemed to intensify. The lamp in the room flickered more violently, and the furniture shook as if it was trying to escape the room. Lucy stood in the middle of the holy water circle, surrounded by lit candles and salt spread out on the floor. She began to recite the words she said would send the spirit away. By the power of the elements, I call upon the spirits to banish this ghost from this place. Let it be gone. Let it be free. So mote it be. The candles flickered and the woman in the sopping wool dress appeared in front of us. You cannot banish me. Lucy stood her ground holding up a piece of sage in one hand 
and a silver bell in the other. I have the power of the elements on my side. You have no power over me. No, the spirit shrieked. I will not leave this place. The ghost disappeared as quickly as she showed, and the room grew calm. I took a seat on the couch and buried my face in my hands. I don't understand, I said. I thought this spell would banish the spirit. Lucy sat down beside me, placing a comforting arm around my shoulders. Sometimes these things are stronger than we realize, she said. We'll have to give it a think and come up with a new plan. The longer that spirit is here, the more danger it poses to us and others. I slapped my knee with frustration. But we've been here all night already! Lucy nodded and her expression got serious. I know, but we need to make sure we have a plan in place before we try to banish it again. We don't want to make the situation worse. I sighed, realizing that she was right. Okay, I said. So what do we do now? Lucy stood up, pacing back and forth. We need to gather more information about this spirit. Watch it. Find out what its weaknesses are. Then we can find a ritual or spell that might be effective in banishing it. I nodded, feeling a glimmer of hope. That makes sense, I said. Maybe even try to communicate with the spirit, see if we can reason with it. Lucy smiled and I saw that sense of determination in her eyes. Exactly, she said. We'll figure this out, but for now, we need to be patient. I didn't like this idea of sitting around. I felt like I was bait, but I did trust Lucy. She's never failed me yet, and we make a pretty good team. In the morning, we found the doctor dead in his bed. His eyes were open and his expression twisted into something grotesque and pained. Lucy and I know it was the ghost that did it and that she wouldn't stop until we got rid of her. Suddenly, the doors to the doctor's room slammed shut without warning. The walls trembled as if the ship itself was about to be split in half. The air became thick with that presence, the same one that was in our room last night. I felt my knees going weak again, as if the very fabric of reality was being torn apart. A scream brought me to attention. It was followed by a series of thumps. Lucy grabbed me by the arm and we ran towards the noise, but it was too late. The cook and the captain were lying in a pool of blood, their bodies twisted and broken. The ghost had claimed more victims. I took out my phone. I was willing to give Lucy last night, but now we had a body count. I had to call this in. As I checked my phone, my heart sank. No reception, zero bars. I asked Lucy to check hers, but she got the same. We went to the highest point of the ship, our arms outstretched like metal detectors, desperate for even a flicker of a signal. Yet, there was nothing, not one lousy bar. We found the emergency phone on the ship and tried that, but it was dead too. Quick, the gangway, I yelled, pulling Lucy's hand as we turned to make a run for it. As we fled, an eerie fog descended on us, obscuring everything in our path. It was as if we were trapped in purgatory, with no way out. It was a blizzard of white and we stumbled forward, our hands flailing in front of us in a desperate search for anything solid. The ghostly presence seemed to be closing in on us, its icy grip tightening with each passing moment. Found something! Lucy said, pulling open the door. As we rushed inside, the thick blanket of fog dissipated, leaving us in a normal-looking hallway. Yet outside, the fog still lingered. We have to do something, I said, my heart rattling against my rib cage. Lucy nodded. Her eyes were wide with fear. I had never seen her scared like this, not with the supernatural anyways. Before we could come up with the plan, the woman in the dripping wet wool materialized through a wall. Her face no longer dribbled foam, but her mouth hung open, exposing black holes where there should be teeth. 
She let out a banshee scream and lunged at us with her hands out. We darted out of the way and she disappeared into the wall on the other side of the hallway. Deranged laughter, haunting and inhuman, echoed throughout the ship. It seemed to emanate from every corner and crevice. It was as if the ghost was mocking us, taunting us with its terrifying presence and filling the air with a sense of madness and dread. I need my tools in the room, Lucy said. We need to end this. As we made our way back to room 5042, the laughter continued. It was clear the ghost was becoming more and more powerful. I prayed Lucy could find the right incantation to stop her. All right, Lucy, let's do this, I said, trying to keep my voice steady though I could feel my hand shaking. Lucy nodded and grabbed her kit. She lit the candles and sprinkled salt around the room. She started to chant, calling out the ghost, commanding it to leave the ship. I watched as the flames flickered, making shadows dance on the wall. But then something went wrong. The candles began to flicker wildly and the salt began to melt. A cold wind blew through the room, making us shiver. The ghost materialized. The candles blew out and we were plunged into darkness. Kevin, we gotta get out of here, Lucy whispered, pawing for my arm before finding it. I don't think I can stop her. She's too powerful. But I think something happened to her. She's here for a reason. We need to find out what that is to release her. The furniture began to rattle and it became hard to breathe as the air became thick. We shuffled our way through the tiny room until we felt the handle of the door and we escaped into the hallway. We ran as fast as we could, stumbling through the corridor as the lights strobed. We looked behind us. The ghost didn't seem to be following, but we knew she was still there, and that it was only a matter of time before she caught up with us again. I think she's a vengeful spirit, Lucy said as we stopped to catch our breath. Either something happened to her, or she had an unjust death. Yeah, but what could it be, I said. Lucy shrugged. The laughter returned, ricocheting down the hallway. Lucy's screams pierced the air, causing my heart to drop to my feet. When I turned to face her, I saw the ghostly figure materialize right before my very eyes, just as it had done before. But this time something was different. The ghost didn't simply pass through Lucy as it had with me. Instead, it seemed to enter her body, as if taking possession of her very soul. I watched in horror as her body twisted and contorted, the ghostly presence merging with her own and becoming one. Lucy! I cried. As I reached out for her, a blast sent me back, knocking me against the wall. It was too late. The spirit was too powerful. Lucy's head jerked this way and that, as if being punched from the left and the right repeatedly. With each blow, Lucy grew weaker and weaker. She was lifted into the air, her body bending in unnatural ways, and then, with a final scream, her spine snapped in half and she dropped to the floor with a thud. A sense of grief and despair came over me. Lucy was gone. I was alone. The ghost hovered over Lucy's body. Her hair hung in matted clumps around her face, her black eyes hollow and empty. Her heavy woolen dress clung to her and dripped the salty-smelling ocean water in which she met her untimely demise. Seeing her glowing aura, I had no idea how I was going to survive this. I had no weapons, None of Lucy's magic words. Nothing. All I had was my wits and my determination. But against a force like this, what chance did I stand? I closed my eyes and whispered a prayer, asking for the strength to get me out of this alive. And then something strange happened. I felt a sense of peace wash over me. I thought of Lucy of all the times we had shared together, and I felt her presence with me, 
her urging me on. I thought of Vicky and how brave she was battling her illness. Their strength gave me strength. I opened my eyes and looked at the ghost, feeling a newfound courage welling up inside of me. When I looked into the ghost's eyes now, they seemed to convey a sense of sadness and longing. I didn't know why the ghost was there, why it was attacking us and the others, but I sure as hell was done running from it. Lucy told me it was a vengeful ghost. I realized I knew something about vengeance. It was the reason I started my private detection business, wasn't it? I was mad about having seen this damn ghost in the first place. Mad about having to retire from the force. As the ghost approached, I could feel the fear rising up in me, threatening to overwhelm me once more. But this time, I was determined to face the ghost head on. You want me, don't you? I told the ghost. It fixed its gaze upon me its black eyes as empty as soulless as the void of space. It was as if those eyes held the weight of all the pain and suffering the ghost had endured. The gaze was intense and unyielding, unnerving me to my very core. I closed my eyes and took a deep breath. My thoughts went to my wife, but I felt she was somehow in trouble. That shot of sorrow again went through me. It was the same thing I experienced when I saw the ghost on vacation. I shook it off. No, it's games from the ghost, I thought. I closed my eyes and visualized a bright light, filling me up from the inside out, chasing away all darkness and fear. I understand, I told the ghost, keeping my eyes closed, trying to stay in that bright light. I used to be consumed by a spirit of vengefulness always seeking to right the wrongs done to me and reclaim what was taken away from me. But now I realize that true peace doesn't come from revenge or retribution. It comes from letting go of anger and resentment, of finding acceptance in what has happened. Only then can we truly move forward and find the happiness and fulfillment we seek. I opened my eyes. The ghost was still there, but something was different. She seemed less substantial, more ethereal. What I said seemed to be working. Go into the light, I said, using a line I heard Lucy say before in other paranormal cases. It's time to let go and move on. I don't know what has happened to you, but from the look of you, it was a long time ago. Too long. You deserve to be at rest. I promise I will search for answers about your death. I will get those answers and I will solve your case. The ghost wavered for a minute, as if considering my words, and then suddenly dissipated into the nothingness. I took a moment to collect myself, feeling the weight of fear lifted from my shoulders. As I turned to leave, my eyes caught a glimmer on the floor. It was the silver necklace the same one that belonged to the ghost, the one I had spotted when I first entered the room 5042. I picked it up and felt cold. As I examined the locket, my throat tightened. The picture inside had changed. No longer was it a black and white photograph of a young woman from another era. Instead, it was a color photograph of my wife, Vicky. What the hell? I screamed as I threw the locket to the ground. It melted into the floor. Maybe the ghost hadn't left yet and was still here, watching me, playing tricks on me. Even though I couldn't shake the feeling of unease that settled into my gut, I left. The sky was clear when I exited the cruise ship doors to the outside world. There was no more fog, and the gangway was down. As I stepped off the cruise ship, The weight of the loss hung heavy in my heart. Lucy, the doctor, the cook, the captain, all gone. The police questioned me about what happened on the ship, but my mind was elsewhere. I needed to call my wife, to hear her voice, and tell her that I was okay. My fingers trembled as I dialed her number, but the voice on the other side wasn't hers. 
I'm sorry, sir. Your wife passed away while you were gone, the voice said. We tried to contact you, but we couldn't reach you. I fell to the ground and curled in a fetal position. Tears streamed down my face as I realized my worst fears had come true. The future used to terrify me, but now it all seems so meaningless. Since Vicky's passing, life has lost all its flavor. I spent so much time fretting about her illness and what good did it do? None at all. And now with Lucy gone, I shut my private detection agency. There's no point in carrying it on without her. It feels like everything I cared about has been taken away from me. I think back to the words I spoke to the ghost about releasing anger and resentment. At the time, I truly believed them. But since getting off that ship, those words have been a bitter pill to swallow. Maybe someday I'll find peace, but right now, I'm all twisted up inside about everything that's happened. My thoughts wander, and before I know it, my hand is shaking and my bones rattle with cold. I remember the promise I made to the ghost, and I know I have one final case to solve. I think maybe if I could see this through and get answers for her, then maybe I can finally find the closure that's been eluding me.